Hello everybody, you're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. We're the weekly art show where we share local arts news, we have a different guest on each week, we head over to the Rylight Zone for uh, some poetry and or some fiction, we play some local unsigned and indie music, and later on in the show we'll head over to the Ilk Shed to catch up with Twanglin' Jack Ford for this week's album review. As always, you can reach me here at the studio by dropping me an email on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk And I particularly want to hear from poets, musicians, anybody in the local creative scene, uh, particularly people who would like to do an interview on the show or who have MP3s that they would like to share. You can also find us on Facebook if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound and we're available on Wickham Sound's Listen Again on the website. We're repeated Monday nights on Wickham Sound and you can listen to us on your podcast provider of choice including iTunes and Spotify as well. So this week we're doing things a little bit different because I'm going to be my own guest. Um, So basically how I've done that is um, out of my YouTube channel uh, where I post videos about books and stuff. I've asked my followers on there to submit their questions uh, and they're going to do the interview for me. But before we get to that Uh, We're going to go to the Rylight Zone and this is one of my short stories called When the Mirror Clouds. This was a short story I wrote for an anthology called Subject Verbed Object, um, which I was the editor of. I think about four or five of our previous guests on the show also contributed to the anthology as well, so there's that. And uh, yeah, we'll just go ahead. When the Mirror Clouds. When the Mirror Clouds. Prompt, Jay pulled at the mirror. Jay Mason hated his reflection. And it wasn't just his reflection, he hated all of them. Ever since he was a kid, for as long as he could remember, he'd been afraid of them. When he was six years old, he'd been riding high on his father's shoulders when he caught sight of the passenger side mirror of a passing car and tried so hard to get away from it that he tumbled to the floor and broke his collarbone. But he knew better than to scream for his mother. His father didn't like that, not one little bit. Cut it out, his father would say. Stop being such a baby. Truth was, at six years old, he was still a baby. He sucked his thumb, wet his bed, and would have pressed his face to his mother's breast if she was still around. But she wasn't. Jay's mother had disappeared not long after he learned to walk. She hadn't walked out on him, she hadn't died, and she hadn't even gone missing. She had just fallen off the face of the earth. His father, distrustful of the police to begin with, had waited a couple of weeks before reporting it, a fact that the prosecutors had gleefully latched onto, but with no evidence and no body, they'd been unable to press charges. That hadn't stopped the neighbours from arriving at their own conclusions, though. Jay's father was a murderer in their eyes, if not in the eyes of the law. It was around that time that the weirdness set in. The old man became a recluse, too proud to move away but too tired to go outside and risk the scorn of the rest of the neighbourhood. He worked from home whenever he could. When he had to go into the office, he kept his head down and tried to avoid his colleagues. Then the house began to change. Jay's father insisted on keeping the curtains closed at all times and grew out the hedges so they blocked the view of the yard. He only used the back door and covered all the mirrors in the house with bed sheets and towels, eventually upgrading to curtains which could be open and closed to suit him. In the end, he learned to shave by feel alone and the curtains remained closed and collected dust, oil and bacteria. The weirdness followed Jay to university. His housemates discovered the foible and started surprising him by jumping out with pocket mirrors whenever he least expected it. That all came to an end after someone pushed him too far by planting a large, freestanding mirror in front of his door. When Jay opened it up, he put his fist straight through it, ending up in the emergency room with nine stitches. After that, everyone knew about the weirdness, but nobody mentioned it. He'd graduated six years earlier and now worked as a counsellor, although he called himself a therapist, in a bustling commuter town. He lived in a masonette with only one mirror to worry about. He was running late to work again. Jay couldn't drive because he couldn't look in the rearview mirror, and the buses were never on time. Unfortunately, the buses were also all he could afford. His patient was waiting for him when he arrived, a middle-aged man with self-confidence issues and an unfair dose of Asperger's. He was followed by a high-strung businesswoman with a nervous tick and a shopping addiction, and then an ex-junkie who successfully kicked the habit but still needed to deal with the issues that caused it. The next patient was a no-show, so Jay ate his lunch and caught up with some paperwork. In the afternoon, he had sessions with a couple more patients and a catch-up meeting with his supervisor. Then he hopped on the bus again and buried his face in a book so he didn't have to deal with the mirrors in the furniture shops on the high street. That evening, after a disappointing dinner and a bad horror film which lived up to its lacklustre reviews, Jay went for a shower. The hot water filled the room with steam, which was lucky. He noticed what was wrong as soon as he stepped out of the cubicle, before he had a chance to wrap himself in a towel. The curtains around the mirror had opened, seemingly of their own accord. He knew they'd been closed when he entered the room, but now they were hanging apart like two corpses in the breeze. 
They were moving, dancing, and Jay could hear a rustling susurrus, whispers from another world. The mirror was steamed over, dull enough for Jay to face his fear and to take a closer look. Something was beginning to form there, little shadows taking shape. Jay shuddered and pulled the curtains back across. He slept badly that night, nauseated by childhood dreams and memories, nightmares about mirrors and reflections. He thought about calling in sick and decided against it. But he was sent home anyway after a complaint from one of his patients. Dr Mortimer, Jay's boss and the head of the facility, called him into his office for a quick chat. Sit down, please, he instructed, and Jay obeyed the order. This won't take long. Dr Mortimer sat down heavily on the other side of the mahogany desk and pinched the bridge of his nose. Okay, he said, I'll try to keep this brief. Now, as you know, we strive to reach the highest standards of excellence here at Sunnyvale. Because of that, we only hire the very best and we expect our staff to have their heads in the game at all times. I think you know where this is going, Jay. Jay shrugged and said, does it have something to do with Miss Robotham? It has everything to do with Miss Robotham, Dr Mortimer replied. She made a complaint after your session. What did she say? Jay asked. She said she felt like the roles had reversed and that you barely let her get a word in. Something about mirrors and reflections. She used the word obsession and said that you attacked her. Is that true? I wouldn't say that, Jay protested. If anything, she attacked me. She pulled out a compact and I knocked it out of her hands. Dr Mortimer sighed and pinched the bridge of his nose again. It had been a long, long day. Listen, Jay, I appreciate you being honest with me, and so I'm going to offer the same courtesy. The bottom line is this. This whole mirror thing is getting out of hand. I think you should take a little time off and try to get your head straight. Just a couple of weeks to begin with. And perhaps you should seek some professional help yourself. Jay nodded meekly and agreed to seek help. He thought about the weirdness. He thought about it long and hard, and he shuddered. Dr Mortimer dismissed him brusquely as his telephone rang and he reached across the desk to answer it. That evening, Jay heard whispers from the mirror again, although this time the curtain stayed shut. The voices were quiet at first, just at the edge of his hearing, but without really seeming to, they started to grow louder and more intense until he could hear different timbres and tonalities. He could hear men and women, children and adults, a distant barking and meowing. He thought he heard his own name, but he wasn't sure. He even thought he heard a scream, or maybe it was the distant whistle of a far-off train. Whatever it was, he didn't like it, so he skipped his shower and used a coin to lock the door from the outside. He didn't get much sleep. He had nightmares about glass and polished metal, bad dreams about mirrors and fevers, and when he climbed out of bed to use the bathroom, the curtains were hanging wide open. Jay reached behind the mirror and tried to take it down, but the damn thing wouldn't budge. He caught a glimpse of his purple face and the bulging tendons in his wrists and upper arms as he yanked at it, and then he screamed and instinctively lashed out, slamming his fist into the shiny surface and spreading a cobweb of cracks across it. A couple of glittering shards embedded themselves into his knuckles, drawing droplets of blood and sending his stomach lurching. He dragged the curtains back across the mirror and fled the bathroom in terror, then spent the rest of the day pulling glass from his knuckles with a pair of tweezers. That night, he worried himself to sleep with old superstitions of seven years' bad luck. He slept badly, but he managed to grab a couple of hours and woke up feeling strangely zen-like and refreshed. Over his first cup of coffee, he resolved to deal with the weirdness once and for all. Jay made himself a spot of breakfast and then headed into the bathroom. He could hear the whispers again, louder and more clearly than before, but the curtains remained mercifully closed. He took a deep breath and opened them, then gasped. The broken surface had repaired itself with not a crack to show it had ever been damaged. Jay shook his head slowly and checked his knuckles. They were still battered, bruised and a little bloody, quite clearly showing the signs of the day before. If it wasn't for that, he might have thought he was going crazy. Jay set his fear aside to take a closer look at the mirror. It seemed to swirl with subtle shadows, dancing slowly on top of his ashen-faced reflection. He saw shapes and letters, blurred faces from the past registering dimly like spots of light from staring at the sun for too long. The whispers intensified into a chorus of voices, all chanting his name. Then the voices converged into one, cycling through pitches and accents until they settled on the single voice of someone he could barely remember. Hello, son, Jay's mother said. Long time no speak. Mother, he whispered, is that really you? It had been so long since Jay had heard her voice, even in a home video, that he couldn't be sure. But the bond between mother and son was a hard bond to break. Jay somehow knew it was her, and he put his fear on hold like a violinist who spots a break in the score and lays his bow down to wipe a bead of sweat from his forehead. It's really me, the voice said, but I don't have much time. I need you to listen carefully. In two days time, when the mirror clears, I'll be back again. Promise me that you'll wait for me. What do you mean? Jay asked. I don't understand. Promise me. I promise, Jay said, but please, mother, tell me what's going on. There was no response. 
As the voices died away, Jay felt the familiar sting of his revulsion. He drew the curtain across the mirror and left the room. For the rest of that day and for much of the next, Jay went from fear to despair and back to fear again. Even his first appointment with the counsellor, Dr Mortimer had freed up his schedule and agreed to meet with Jay himself, did little to ease his anxiety. If anything, it made it worse. In the evening, Jay braved the bathroom. The whispers had quietened down to a low hum, and the curtain was drawn haphazardly across, just how he'd left it. Mum? Jay whispered, tentatively. But there was no response, not even when he tried again with a little more authority. He hesitated for a second and then jerked the curtains open. The mirror had clouded over, but the shadowy figures were closer to the surface than ever before. Jay stared in wonder for a couple of seconds, then shuddered and turned away again. He slept soundly that evening without a single one of the night terrors that he'd grown so used to. But when he woke up, he was filled with a stomach-churning blend of excitement, apprehension and anxiety. He didn't eat and he didn't drink. He waited. There was something in the air, some sort of palpable electric energy. He found himself resisting the urge to check the mirror, filled with the knowledge that when the time was right, he'd know it. The seconds dragged slowly by, turning into minutes and hours with a dull, inevitable certainty. At five minutes to midnight, he was ready. It was time. Jay could hear the mirror's fevered murmurings from out in the hallway, but as soon as he opened the bathroom door, a sudden silence descended. For a brief, crazy moment, Jay wondered whether this was what vultures heard as they pillaged corpses after a battle. He was scared like a survivor, but he swallowed his fear, gathered his resolve and walked inside, then locked the door behind him. He drew open the curtains, bracing himself for the reflection, but it still took him by surprise. He saw his own eyes, his own nose, and something of his own jawline, but the similarities ended there. It was enough. Jay had seen the old family photographs, and his mother hadn't aged a day since her disappearance. My son, she whispered. The mirror was like a window with another bathroom on the other side. It's time. What do you mean, mother? Jay asked. He stepped a little closer to the mirror. He could feel a gentle breeze, a wind from another world. I don't understand. Hush, child, be patient. You'll have your answer soon enough. She reached forwards, slowly but confidently, and laid the palm of her hand against the surface. Jay hesitated and thought about pulling back, but it was far too late for that. It was time to face his fear or die trying. When he pressed his hands against his mother's, he felt her warmth as it surged through the glass and into his fingertips. He'd always thought of mirrors as cold, emotionless things, but this one was full of life and love. He smiled and closed his eyes, and then the horror began. He felt an ice-cold hand around his wrist, and his eyes shot open while his mouth flashed in a silent O, a muted scream of surprise. His mother's eyes had changed, and the love had been replaced by a steely determination. Her hand had gone from warm and clammy to cold and dry, and her upper arm was sticking out of the mirror like the unholy appendage of a monster at the bottom of the sea. She reached out with her other hand, and Jay watched as it burst through the mirror and grabbed hold of him. She yanked with superhuman strength, like a pneumatic piston firing on all cylinders, and Jay was falling, falling, falling into the mirror and through to the other side. Back in the real world, in the empty bathroom, the curtains drew closed of their own accord. Six days later, when Dr Mortimer called the police after Jay failed to make his appointment or to answer his mobile phone, the door to the bathroom was kicked open by the heavy boot of a first responder. They were expecting a body, but there was nothing, just a distant whisper and a misty mirror. Sergeant Mogford, the cop with the heavy boot, took a closer look and thought he could see two shadows dancing back and forth across his retinas. Find anything? He glanced towards the door and thought about his colleagues, who were combing the apartment for clues. He wondered what they'd say if he'd told them he'd seen shapes and heard voices. The decision was made for him. No, he replied, nothing. After the policemen left the scene to write up their reports, the whispering grew a little louder and the shapes started to solidify. The curtain drew closed of its own accord. The weirdness was only just beginning. All right, that was When the Mirror Clouds by myself, Dane Cobain. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. And this is Robert Honor with Worm Food.
and she's falling through time Picking a broken glass at closing time She won't be forgotten like yesterday's news She's soaking in lemon and lime And I close my eyes A feeling inside that I just can't describe Cause I'm tired of talking, I'm tired of words And I'm trying not to write lines that rhyme Should I waste all my time while I ride on wrong night? Should I break down and cry before you? And I feel like But I'm starting to feel so I'm dealing with it And I don't wanna hide or believe in the hype So I, I give it That was Sober by The Ilk, my band, and indeed it was one of my songs. Before that we had Worm Food by Robert Honor. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and this is the point where we would normally go over to this week's guest for an interview, but this week I am my own guest, and um, I've asked people who subscribe to my YouTube channel to send in their questions, so we're going to go ahead and do that. In no particular order, we'll start with this one from Fit To Be Read. He asked, how do you split time between your art and projects? Do you prefer to schedule or is it what you feel in the moment? So this is a kind of a complicated one for me. Uh, I work with something that I call the schedule and basically I divide time into periods of like 45 minutes. So theoretically, it's 15 minutes of computer stuff, 15 minutes of tidying and then 15 minutes of writing. Um, but actually what I tend to do is I do uh, five minutes of each and then the remaining 30 minutes is split between either filming and editing booktube videos um, or when I'm doing work I sort of split into half an hour and I do 15 minutes of timed stuff where I'm charging by the hour and then 15 minutes of untimed stuff because when I'm doing the untimed stuff that's when I also check my work emails and bid for jobs and all that sort of thing. Um, since moving house, uh, I've basically done a load of tidy time because it was all my unpacking and stuff. So I'm actually, I actually owe like minus a thousand minutes of tidying. Um, but I also owe about five and a half thousand minutes of writing. So you can see what's happened there. I've spent more time tidying than writing. Hence my uh, projects haven't really moved along much this year. I've also spent a lot more time doing work this year just to be able to pay for my house basically. Um, so at the moment, looking at my screen, I owe 2,420 minutes of untimed work and 2,240 minutes of timed work. So that's going to take me probably until Christmas to catch up with that lot. Um, and at the moment I'm catching up with that by instead of doing 45 minute loops, I'm doing 55 minutes. Um, and doing an extra 5 minutes of um, untimed and 5 minutes of timed work each time. And uh, yeah, then I have like a five minute break to uh, vape and read. So that's how I get stuff done. It's kind of a complicated answer, but it's a system I've been using for a while and it works for me. So the bookish report, Alex, he asked, choose one of the following. He actually sent a few. I said I was going to do all of them. So number one, Stone Cold Steve Austin or The Rock? Ooh, that's a that's a tough one. Probably, 
I'm, I'm, I'm feeling Stone Cold Steve Austin at the moment. Uh, I've actually read books about both of them, um, although they were both kind of outdated because, for example, The Rocks, uh, his was his memoir, but it was before he really got into acting, so it was mostly about his time with the WWF, as it was at the time, and um, doing, like, college American football. But Stone Cold Steve Austin has just got, like, a great, you know, persona. I mean, he is Stone Cold Steve Austin. If you ever see him, like, outside of the ring just doing interviews and stuff, he's still the same dude. Question number two, how vinegary is too vinegary? I mean, very vinegary. When I was a kid, I once, I was putting vinegar on a pizza because that's the kind of person I am. And the lid fell off the vinegar and it just drowned this pizza in vinegar and I still ate it. Um, when I used to get chips from the chip shop and I'd get them in a cone, I'd drown them with vinegar and then there'd be like a little puddle of vinegar at the end, right at the bottom. And then I would drink the vinegar. I love vinegar, it's great. Question number three, you have a lot of experience with independent publishing now. Aside from the actual writing of books, what advice do you have for an aspiring indie author? What is the process? What could they expect? Where they should hire outsource and where could they do things themselves, etc. Okay, so obviously, yeah, aside from the writing of books. So you, your main two choices for this, you have uh, Amazon's KDP or Ingram Spark. Ingram Spark costs money, so I would suggest probably going with Amazon KDP um, if you're like on a budget. In terms of what you can do yourself, there's actually not a lot. If you're good at graphic design, you can do a cover, but I would suggest work with a, hire a professional cover designer, hire a professional editor, uh, do those at the very least. You might be able to do the interior layout yourself as long as you're like really know what you're doing because you want to make sure it's justified, uses nice fonts, looks good inside, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, you'll also, for the ebook, there are specific like ways that ebooks are formatted. So you want to hire somebody who knows how to format uh, like a Mobi or an EPUB file. Basically, it's a bit like designing a responsive web page, if you know anything about web design. Um, it just makes sure that the book looks good on all different devices, whether it's a Kindle or a mobile phone or whatever it is. Um, you can probably hire people. I mean, I, I use Upwork to get a lot of my jobs, but I hire people from people per hour because I find that a little bit cheaper. You also might be able to get people quite cheap from Fiverr. Um, yeah. What's the pro process and what you can expect? You mean, well basically you've got, you finish your first draft, you send it off to your editor, you probably want to do at least three passes with your editor if you can afford it. Uh, it doesn't come cheap, but I mean, you're not going to make any money back on your books as well, that's what to expect. But yeah, three passes with your editor, um, and you do your rewrites, etc. Then you're want, going to want to give it one last proofread. You can probably do that yourself or with beta readers or with a friend or something like that. Uh, then you want to get it sent to layout ready for the print version and the ebook versions. Get your cover design sorted and then you can pretty much go from there. You're going to want to get a proof copy printed and shipped to you to make sure it looks okay. And um, yeah, you're probably going to want to do some marketing and stuff as well, like uh, cover reveals and all that kind of stuff before the book actually goes live. And yeah, what to expect? You're not going to make any money. You're going to lose money. Uh, for me, it's a bit like music. Like I've earned music uh, money from music here and there by doing gigs and stuff, but it doesn't pay for all of the instruments and all the gear and all the travel and all that kind of stuff. At best, it offsets it, you know. And I found books to be pretty similar. Um, but for me, because I freelance as a writer, my books allow me to charge more by the hour, so they kind of pay for themselves that way. Question number four: What are your thoughts on publishing a short story that will be part of a collection that will be published at a later date, like releasing a single off an upcoming album? Yeah, sure, go for it. Um, especially if you've got like that kind of hungry audience that wants it. Um, I've also done this the other way. So I've had um, stories that have gone out in anthologies that have then been in my own short story collections. The only thing to do is like check the contract, make sure that you are allowed to do that. Um, if you're just releasing a short story of your own that you're later gonna publish in a collection, yeah, go ahead and do it. I would just say, try and include some sort of call to action with that short story. So maybe try and get people to sign up to a mailing list or something like that so that if they read the short story and enjoy it, you can then promote the book to them once it's out. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and this is my band, The Ilk, with Watch the Planet Die. <laughs>
the planet die by the ilk you're listening to the art show on 106.6 fm wickham sound i'm your host dane cobain and this week i am my own guest so i'm answering some questions that were sent to me over on my youtube channel so let's get into it okay question from big hard books and classics you sent a couple as well uh who is your favorite horror author and why well that's easy that's stephen king you just can't beat stephen king i mean he's one of the, the just the best authors in general i think sure like he's not always amazing sometimes he like fluffs the ending and, and things like that um but just in terms of a mixture of quality and quantity, Stephen King is the man. And question number two, when are we creating our next Bob Dylan cover and which song shall it be and why? So me and Al from Big Hard Books and Classics, we do a few online collaborations where I play guitar and sing and he plays mouth organ. So I mean, it's got to be something with uh, mouth organ. To be honest, I can't remember which ones we've done so far. Um, but I'm going to say what I would love to do would be um, uh, The Man In Me because I've, I've been really enjoying that song recently. So Too Tight Lautrec has asked, do you have creative doldrums? And if so, how do you kick yourself out of it slash them? Or do you just relax and rest up until you're ready to work again? Um, I'm a workaholic, so I never really rest. Um, the closest I come to resting is working, but at least I'll be sitting down. Um, I guess I do have creative doldrums. I'm kind of in the middle of one now. I've started writing this book um, that's going to be set in my hometown of Tamworth. Kind, It's kind of a coming of age novel, set when and where I came of age, you know? Um, and it's just a hard one to write. Um, so to be honest, I've just been putting off writing that. Um, but normally I'm working on so many projects that if I have creative doldrums about one project, I just move on and work on something else, you know, and then come back to it later and, it, and it's fine. Uh, Ms. Reads A Lot says, what unread book has been on your shelf the longest? Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna check my Goodreads for this. Okay, so it's uh, Christopher Vogler's The Writer's Journey, Mythic Structure for Writers, which I will be getting to soon. It's just a non-fiction book about the art of writing. That's kind of why I've been putting it off, you know? Although I think Goodreads, it sorts not, not necessarily by the time I put them on my shelves, but by the date I added them to my want to read list. Because uh, the next one up is Across the River and Into the Trees by Ernest Hemingway. And I picked that up like two weeks ago at a charity shop. But it says here, the date added for the writer's journey, June the 23rd, 2013. So I should get to that soon, really. And Ms. Reads a lot also asked, what's your favorite book of all time? That is uh, Northern Lights by Philip Pullman. I actually have a tattoo of Yorick Bernison, the armored bear. And uh, yeah, it's just the book that made me fall in love with reading. I actually gave it to my friend Sabrina recently because uh, she hasn't read it. And you know, she should read it. Uh, Al from Big Heart Books and Classics, he has another question. Robert McCallman should get talked more about on Booktube. Do you agree? No, I mean, I've never read him, so I, I can't say I care. Um, maybe, I, I don't know. I'm sure people out there are talking about it, and that's the good thing about Booktube. So for those of you who are listening to this on the radio as opposed to watching on YouTube, Booktube is like a YouTube community of people who make videos talking about books. They share what they're currently reading, reviews, book hauls, all that sort of thing. Um, but the good thing about Booktube is that you can find people talking about pretty much whatever authors you're interested in, you know? Uh, here we have Zoe. She asks, what's your top five Goosebumps books and why? Okay. Well, I'm just going to go with the first five that come into my head. Um, my favourite one is probably The Masked Mutant, or Attack of the Mutant is called, sorry. Um, and uh, this 
it's basically it's just the one I read the most. I had a lot of nightmares about it when I was a kid. Um, it's about this this young lad who uh, discovers that one of his favourite superheroes and supervillains is actually real. And it's kind of interesting that that one ranks highly for me because I normally don't like superhero stuff and I'm not a fan of like Marvel and that kind of thing. Uh, another one would be A Night at Terror Tower, and um, this is like got a bit of time travel in it, um, kind of Tower of London vibes. Uh, this actually inspired the story that I wrote called Not in Tamworth anymore for the We're Not Home anthology, edited by Cam Wolf, which is out now, so go and read that. Uh, what else is up there? Um, the Curse of Camp Nightmare, or whatever it's called. Welcome to Camp Nightmare, I think it's called. Uh, again, these are all basically the ones I read as a kid. I, I found that a lot with reading uh, Goosebumps recently as an adult. Basically, it's the nostalgia that makes them, so it's the ones that I read as a kid that I enjoy the most. And uh, that one, I guess I liked as well because uh, it was like my first ever exposure to like American uh, summer camp uh, culture. Then there's probably Say Cheese and Die about a haunted camera. Just used to freak me out. I, I still don't particularly like having my photo taken, and it could well be because of that. And then probably the other one is... Um, um, Probably Piano Lessons Can Be Murder, or the one that the title I can't remember at the moment about the, the librarian who was a monster. One of those two. Uh, Zoe also asked, who's your favourite author of all time? So that's a very difficult question. I don't know if I can give you one favourite author. Um, my top five are probably Agatha Christie, uh, Stephen King, Graham Greene, Philip Pullman and Charles Bukowski, maybe? Oh, I don't know. It's hard. It's hard to choose just, just five of you. Uh, Zoe also asked, what other books would you like to collect? So, I used to collect all of the books that I'd read. Now I don't do that. I chuck them up on eBay just to kind of keep cycling through them and make sure that I have room for more books. So I don't know if there's any particular books I would like to collect. Eventually, I probably will work on my book collection and get some really nice editions of, like, all of the Stephen King books, all of the Discworld books, all of the Agatha Christie books. Um... But, you know, that's expensive. And seeing as a, even if I do reread them, I'll probably reread them via audiobook anyway. It's kind of low priority for me. Zoe also asked, what's a book that's underrated but you think deserves much attention? Um, Meat by Dane Cobain. This is my novel, set on a factory farm. Um, the animals revolt, basically. And it's very heavily grounded in what actually goes on at factory farms. It's the book that turned me into a vegan from doing all the research for it. Um, and I just think it's the best thing I've ever written. Todd the Librarian on YouTube also said it's one of the best horror novels he's ever read and that is a big compliment because he, the man reads Stephen King. Carmela Maig asked, what's your top five books of all time? So I guess for this I'm just going to go back to my top five authors and choose one book by each of them. So obviously we have uh, Philip Pullman, Northern Lights. Uh, for Terry Pratchett, my favourite Terry Pratchett book is probably Feet of Clay. Um, which is like a murder mystery city watch book with a golem in it um, And it's just because it's one of the first Discworld books that I read and one that I've read the most times And also I love the city watch books For Graham Greene It is probably The Quiet American or Our Man in Havana Probably Our Man in Havana um, That's one of his entertainments as opposed to what he called his serious novels uh, Kind of espionage based set in Havana uh, Following a vacuum cleaner salesman called Mr. Vermwald and uh, I also saw a play version of it once as well, which was great. I went by myself because nobody would go with me. For Stephen King, it's The Stand, even though I've recently got a new tattoo uh, from It. But it's because It has a lot more visual imagery. It was kind of hard to think of something from The Stand that I could get as a tattoo. And It is probably my second favourite of his, to be fair. And then Agatha Christie... Probably And Then There Were None is my favourite of hers, um, even though it doesn't feature Poirot. I actually prefer Miss Marple to Poirot anyway, so that could also be, be part of the reason why. And finally, one last question from Zoe. She asked, do you play video games? I do not play video games. I used to when I was younger. Uh, if I do now, which is very, very rarely, and usually if I've had a few beers, um, I'd be like retro gaming, playing Super Nintendo games on an emulator. Um, yeah, I used to play some of those like point and click games. I guess I play like Bloons Tower Defense 5 and chess on my phone as well. I watch a lot of people on YouTube playing uh, video games. Um, and so that's kind of how I get my video game fixed these days. 
Um, I just don't have time to do it myself. Also, back in the day, I was like top 5,000 RuneScape players, and uh, eventually I sold my account and all of my gold for like 2,000 pounds, which is like two and a half thousand dollars, even though it was against their terms of service. So, probably shouldn't be saying this in a public forum. All right, thank you very much, me, for joining me. You're listening to the Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound, and this is The Ilk with Lean Down on Me.
you're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound, I'm your host Dane Cobain, and it's time for us to head over to the Ilk Shed to catch up with Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album review. Sly and the Family Stone, Stand. Sylvester Stewart is very much an unsung hero. People now might be familiar with the big hit, Dance to the Music, and his final big hit, Family Affair, but in between is some of the funkiest rock music and rockiest soul music ever played. Sly and the Family Stone were a multiracial, mixed gender band that brought catchy messages of interracial harmony to the troubled late 60s. Before Prince and Michael Jackson, Sly was uniting the youth, but it ended for him in the usual rock star downfall. Like so many of his ilk, he disappeared up his own ego. He succumbed to drugs and unreliability, almost before that was even a thing. He also had an irresistibly sexy voice, which he never overused, allowing it to sit amongst all the other voices. The vocal style was quite like the Temptations were doing at the time, with different voices calling and answering each other, including a very deep bass voice. Unlike the Motown acts, these were not matching suited vocalists with dance routines, but freaky cool hippie dudes grooving with rock instruments and horns, A tableau of big hats, afro hair, feathers and boas, buckskin fronds and cool, cool shades, letting off musical party streamers and fireworks, taking you higher. There are some great songs on this album, and there is a guitar-led instrumental jam, which in retrospect looks like a time filler, but which at the time would have proved appealing to rock fans. The song Stand is a hymn to individuality, which hooks you with its constantly shifting key changes. Take You Higher would be familiar to anyone who has seen the film Woodstock. You Can Make It If You Try is a very temptationsy sounding number with an inspirational message. And there is a song about racism that has an unrepeatable title. And then there is Everyday People, the happiest, catchiest, sloganeering protest song ever, hitting home hard with its use of playground chanting. Different strokes for different folks, and so on, and so on, and scooby dooby dooby. They also warned us that the higher the price, the nicer the nice, and vice versa. Because somebody's watching you. Stand, Sly and the Family Stone. Big thank you to Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album review. Thanks to all of the acts who let me play some of their music today. As always, you've been listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. You can listen on Catch Up on the Wickham Sound website on the Wickham Sound Listen Again. We're also repeat here on Monday nights if you miss an episode. And you can also check us out on Spotify, iTunes and various podcasting platforms. You can find us on Facebook if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound. And you can drop me an email here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. So I'm going to love you and leave you for this week. Thanks so much for listening. This is Your Fear by Fabulous Parfait. I'll see you next week.
Christy came to tea. When, 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 she knocked on.